quantum computing. It's been all over the news lately, often accompanied by an air of mystique or an assortment of fantastic promises. But what does quantum mean in the context of computer hardware? What distinguishes a quantum computer from a regular one? What does a quantum computer look like? How do we build it? My name is Marissa Justina, and I'm a research scientist in the Google AI Quantum Hardware Lab. I'd like to unpack those questions, and hopefully, in about five minutes, the term quantum computer will have just a little more meaning for you. We're working to build devices that we can interact with, that is, devices we can control and read out, which behave reliably according to a simple quantum model. In other words, we're building quantum computing hardware. Quantum hardware can be used as a tool for approaching certain kinds of computational problems. So our ongoing efforts are both to develop the hardware and to develop algorithms that leverage this hardware. Let's start with the first question. What does it mean for hardware to be quantum? For that, we'll talk for a moment about quantum mechanics. A model is the physicist's tool to make predictions about what will happen when we put the universe into a certain configuration and poke it in a certain way. For example, if you'd never built a skyscraper before, you might make a Lego version before building at full scale. That's a model. Models can also be expressed in the language of mathematics. The most fundamental model of nature we know was developed in the early 20th century and is known as quantum mechanics. The word mechanics refers to the mechanisms by which things happen. The word quantum refers to discrete quantities of energy or some other physical quantity. Within quantum mechanics, energy comes in packets, sometimes called photons, and you cannot have fractional packets. So what's a quantum object? People sometimes think of a quantum object as being tiny and a quantum leap as being large. However, the word quantum doesn't dictate an object's size. Actually, a quantum object is one that relates in a well-defined way to a single quantum of energy. For instance, the photon I mentioned before is a quantum object. A photon is a single particle of energy. Similarly, atoms are quantum objects. An electron flying around an atomic nucleus may be excited into a higher orbit only by a particular quantum of energy. There's no halfway point between the lower orbit and the upper orbit. If the wrong energy is provided, there simply isn't a corresponding orbit for the electron to land in. In a nutshell, a quantum object is one whose observable behavior reflects that nature only offers energy in discrete packets. Now, on to the next question. What differentiates quantum computing hardware from a regular computer? In essence, quantum hardware lives in a richer world than its conventional counterpart. Let's consider a simple abstract quantum object, which is entirely described by the fact that it can be in one of two different energy levels. Let's call those levels zero and one. You can interpret those brackets around the zero to mean this is a quantum energy level called zero, and likewise for the one. Here, for example, is a quantum energy state named psi. Recall the classical bit of information, a switch that can take one of two values, zero and one. Because of the apparent similarity between our quantum object and that classical bit of information, we call this quantum analog a quantum bit or qubit. One peculiar feature about quantum mechanics is the existence of superpositions. A superposition is like a special mixture of the energy levels zero and one, where the weight of each energy level is given by complex constants C0 and C1. If we measure the energy of our qubit, we will sometimes observe zero and sometimes one, where the value of sometimes is given by the constants. An individual measurement will yield an outcome of zero or one. There are no other options. But before the measurement occurs, we know at most the chances of getting a zero or a one. We can't know the actual outcome for sure until we measure it. Therefore, when we want to talk about the energy state of the qubit before we've made the measurement, we use this superposition to represent that the qubit hasn't decided yet which outcome to display, even though the chances of getting each outcome are fixed. Now, even admitting that this superposition business is a little unusual, we can accept that it's easy enough to represent one qubit. We just wrote it down right there. Thinking about more qubits gets increasingly difficult. Suppose we add a second qubit. If these were conventional switches, we could think about each switch independently, but qubits are different. Just as one qubit can be in a superposition state, two qubits can share a superposition state, where, for instance, the measurement outcome is unknown, but will certainly be the same for both objects or opposite for both objects. For example, here's a state where a blue qubit and a yellow qubit are together in a superposition state. 
Here, they're correlated to each other. Before the measurement, it cannot be known whether the blue qubit will turn up 0 or 1. But a measurement of both qubits will certainly always give the same answer for each. Similarly, in this case, measuring the blue and yellow qubits will always give opposite outcomes. This means that in order to fully describe two qubits, we need to consider Cs for all possible measurement outcomes we could see. To describe three qubits, we need eight Cs. Describing four qubits takes 16 Cs, and so on. Each time we add another qubit, it takes twice as much information to describe the whole pile of them. That is the crux of what differentiates quantum hardware. The quantum system lives in a richer space, so that representing n qubits with a classical computer requires 2 to the n numbers. But does this mean that a quantum memory with 100 qubits corresponds to a conventional memory with 2 to the 100 bits? Not so fast! Quantum hardware is very effective at encoding and processing certain kinds of information, but it cannot efficiently mimic many useful aspects of its classical counterpart. When we say that a picture is worth a thousand words, we don't abolish words entirely in favor of pictures. Adding quantum hardware to our modern computing capabilities would be like adding pictures to a communication strategy that up to now used only words. So what does quantum hardware do well? The exponentially growing complexity of quantum systems also gives a clue about where quantum hardware could be useful. In the fields of chemistry and materials development, Simulation of molecules could be a powerful technique to learn about the properties of a new molecule before fully synthesizing it in the lab. However, our ability to simulate chemistry on computers is limited. At its heart, chemistry is an application of quantum mechanics, and each electron we add to a model doubles the number of parameters, crippling computers with expensive calculations already for very small molecules. Suppose instead that we could build chemistry models out of a quantum LEGO set. Then the model would be built with the same physics that governs the system being modeled. In fact, chemistry and material simulations have appeared as an appealing near-term problem to approach using quantum hardware. We finally reached the last question. What does a quantum computer look like, and how do we build it? Let's take a quick look at the actual hardware we're building at Google. Our qubits are resonant electrical circuits made of patterned aluminum on a silicon chip that slosh electrical current back and forth at two different energy levels to encode the quantum 0 and 1 states. Here's an example of one of our quantum chips. Each chip features 72 qubits. As you can see, it's about the size of a quarter. We want each qubit to behave as one single quantum object with two levels. Any other particle interacting with the qubit from its environment pulls it away from this two-level ideal. So creating a clean qubit environment is a critical challenge. At the same time, we want to be able to control the qubits efficiently, adding and removing quanta of energy and letting pairs of qubits interact to exchange energy with each other on demand. These requirements seem to oppose each other. Ideal qubits should be perfectly clean to interact with nothing, but then in specific cases we want them to interact very strongly. This gives one insight into the tensions and challenges of building good quantum hardware. A first step toward building clean qubits is to build the qubit circuits out of superconducting materials, which experience no electrical loss. Superconductors perform only at very low temperatures, and we operate our qubits in a cryostat at less than 50 millikelvin, just a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. The cold temperatures and vacuum inside a cryostat also contribute to keeping the qubit environment clean. The cryostat consists of a series of nested plates and cans. The warmest stage is at the top, and it gets colder as you go down. All the equipment in the central core of the cryostat is responsible for getting things cold. Our hardware is installed around the edges and on the bottom coldest plate. Each qubit chip must be mounted in a package, which holds the chip at millikelvin temperatures and bridges the gap between big cables and a small chip. To address the packaged chip, electronics outside the cryostat send signals through cables in the cryostat. Each cable must carry electrical signals from room temperature all the way down to the coldest stage, while leaking only the smallest amount of heat, a large heat load would prevent the cryostat from reaching its millikelvin base temperature. A collection of filters and amplifiers outfits each cable for its specific task. The electronics outside the cryostat are controlled by code running on a computer. They generate precisely calibrated electrical signals, shaped pulses of microwave radiation, which are sent to control and read out the qubits. This entire system, from chip to cryostat, cables to code, is all necessary to run our quantum hardware. I hope you've enjoyed digging into some quantum computing basics with me in these last few minutes. 
We talked about the meaning of the word quantum, in particular as it relates to computer hardware. Considering the idea of a single qubit in superposition and then adding more qubits, we saw that each time we add another qubit, it takes twice as much information to describe the whole pile of them. That's what really distinguishes a quantum computer from a regular one. Finally, I hope you enjoyed the quick lab tour to get a basic sense of what our quantum computer looks like and what technology we're developing in order to build it. Hopefully the words quantum computer now have just a little more meaning to you than they did five minutes ago. For more detailed information about how we make and program our quantum processors, I invite you to have a look at the links in the description below.